Yes. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good moed. Chag Sameach. Again, it's... Uh... Was that you, Yitzi? That was me. Okay, good. Okay, so I want to say, um, uh, um, it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, uh, our, our, our speaker tonight um, in our uh, Tuesday night uh, talk series is Rabbi Dr. Yitzi Ehrenberg. I believe everyone on the Zoom uh, knows um, uh, Yitzi. Most of us know him uh, just from around uh, the Young Israel of Brookline uh, and the community and as a friend. Um, uh, but uh, many do not know that uh, relatively recently, uh, Rabbi Dr. Ehrenberg uh, has also been serving uh, as the BU Hillel's Chomsky Orthodox Educator, um, a position um, uh, installed in 2020 in, uh, in memory of Mr. Claude Chomsky, father of Joseph Chomsky, who is on the Zoom with us. Hello, Joseph, thank you for, uh, for joining us. And um, I, I think I noticed at least one uh, BU student also on the Zoom. Um, uh, maybe there are two actually. And um, uh, Yitzi is doing incredible work, very important work serving um, uh, amongst everything else he does, the uh, Jewish men and women of, uh, of BU, which is uh, something very important for uh, our community um, as well. And um, as mentioned in the in the email announcing the talk tonight, uh, the BU Hillel is also um, in the middle of a uh, of a campaign to raise uh, some really necessary funds uh, to serve the Orthodox students at BU Hillel that until recently um, uh, really were, were being underserved. And uh, they're our neighbors, they're part of the, the Brookline community. Uh, we've been seeing them in Shoal. And um, uh, it certainly is a very worthwhile cause. And if uh, you can check out the link in, in the email, and um, certainly would encourage uh, contributing to, uh, to that campaign. Uh, the topic of tonight is Ein Chadash Tachas Hashemesh, the past, present, and future of Chadash. If you're not 100% sure what that refers to, uh, so uh, Yitzi will explain it all to us right now. And uh, without further ado, Rabbi Dr. Yitzi Ehrenberg. Thank you very much, Rabbi Hellman. Um, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Uh, feel free to stop me with any questions. A lot of the transla translations that I have here for the sources are not necessarily mine. I apologize if there's any uh, typos. Some of them are mine, those, those typos especially, but uh, let's jump right into it. Um, the Torah says, and we read this just a couple of days ago, that, and we'll look at the source shortly, um, that we're not allowed to eat grain that's new until after the Karbana Omer. We'll look at that, at that source closely in a minute. And this is not necessarily something that people are thinking about all the time these days. So I thought I would, I would talk about you know, where this all came from, the past of uh, what Kharash has been, uh, the, the present, basically the last 2000 years until today, especially the issue of Kharash Vizman Azeh and Chutz Laaretz, how we deal with Kharash and the Isra of Chadash in, uh, as exists outside the land of Israel. And then talk about you know, possibilities for the future of Chadash. And um, you have to stay to the end. You have to stay awake until the end in order to hear what I'm talking about over there. Okay, so let's start. Biblical and Temple Times is where we're starting. And we're starting with uh, what we just read yesterday is that correct? Yesterday on the second day of Yom Tov. Um, so the Torah says, When you come to the land, and you reap the harvest, it says here in the English, you shall bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. And he's, the priest is going to wave this uh, sheaf before Hashem. On your behalf. After the Shabbos, uh, the Kohen will wave it. And there's also an animal carbon that goes along with this uh, sheaf, with the first sheaf which you brought. And a mincha offering, a mincha so shneas, or nim solas bulabashemen, ishel ahashem, 
also a libation. Finally, which is the sense that we're going to hone in on now, Velechem the Kaliva Charmel, Lo Sochalu. Ad etzem hayom hazeh. Until that very day, uh, you should not eat lechem, kali, and charmel. We'll translate that in a second. Ad haviachem es karban alochichem. Until you bring this karban that was talked about up here, this bringing this first sheaf to the kohen, chukas olam adorosichem. This is a rule for you forever. B'chomosh rosichem in all of your settlements. Lechem, kali, and charmel are translated here as bread, lechem. Kali is parched grain. And caramel is fresh ears. So any form of wheat says, Lo sochalu ad you should not eat until this day comes, until you bring this carbon. So that's a biblical source. That's what it says. That's where that's what the is Isra of Khadash is. It's it's right here in Pasuk Yodalid, that until we bring this carbon, you can't eat any of the new grain that has been grown. So we'll now look at um, the Mishnah, which is brought down in Menachos on uh, da, Daf uh, Samachai. It talks about what are some of the parameters and how did they perform this whole um, this whole carbon. And we'll see that it was actually quite a ceremony. You know, it was not just something that happened in the base of Megdash and the Kohanim dealt with it. It was a really big ceremony. So the Mishnah starts, mitzvah sa omer lavo min It's a mitzvah, it's preferred to bring the omer from a close location, a close location to Jerusalem. However, lo biker hakarov liyushalayim. But if it's not ripe yet, you know, in the closest place, the closest uh, field to the Beis HaMikdash, then you bring from wherever the closest one is, that is right. Maybe in Osomi Kol Makom, you can bring it from anywhere. This is just an example the Mishnah is bringing that one, one time they really had to go really far away. It doesn't say quite how far away in the Mepharshim that I could find, but they had to bring uh, grain from really far away in order to do this carbon. So now, what was this whole ritual? What did they do when they were doing the Omer? Shulche based in Yotzin Me'er of Yom Tov. First, the uh, messengers of the basin would go out on Erev Yom Tov before Pesach. The Osin also krichos b'mechubar lakarka, and they would make, um, you know, they would fashion sheaves while still attached to the ground. Why would they do this? Kadeshe yehe noach liktors that it would be easy for it to be harvested, and this was a really big event. Uh, when they would go and harvest later. All of the nearby cities would come and gather at this place. So that when the katsir would happen, when the harvesting would happen, it would be with great fanfare. And Kevin Shechashecha, once Yom Tov ended, once Yom Tov ended, the first day of Pesach ended, Omer Lahem, the Shluche Beistin, who were, going to, who were going to collect this sheaf and bring it back to the base of Mekdash, they would, you know, say with a megaphone to the crowd, Baha Shemesh, has the sun set yet? Omrim Hain. Yes. The people would respond, yes, it did set. And then they would repeat, Baha Shemesh, Omrim Hain. Did the sun set? Yes, it did. You know, Magel Zu, should we use this, you know, implement this tool in order to do this katira omrim hain, magal zu omrim hain. They would repeat it again. And then kapa zu, should I put it in this box? Omrim hain, kapa zu omrim hain. They would repeat that over and over. And then if it was on Shabbos, the Shabbos omr lahem, Shabbos zu, should I take this, you know, this implement and should I harvest this grain even though it's Shabbos? Um, omrim hain. They would say yes, they would say it multiple times. Exor. They would do the uh, exor. Should I make the cut? Mehen omrim lo ketzor. Yes, go ahead and harvest that. And then they would again repeat it. Shalosh pamim al kol davar They would repeat it three times. It says here, hein omrim lo hein hein hein. And they would all say in unison. They would respond, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and do this ritual. But kol kachlama. And why would they have this whole uh, fanfare? The Mishnah explains it was. It was for political reasons. 
מפני הביסוסים, שהיו אומרים אין קציר סעומר במוצא יום טוב. וביתוסים מוצא that there is no harvest on מוצא יום טוב. The Baitusim were a group of Jews who felt that, uh, that they didn't accept the, uh, the Masora, the oral law, and they had their own interpretation of the Chumash. And if we look back on the previous page, we went over this a little quickly, but it says, um, where does it say it? It says here, Mimacharas HaShabbas, Yini Fenu HaKohen. It says, I translated it as after Shabbos, you would bring the Kohen. Well, the uh, accepted Masorah of the rabbis, of the Mishnah, is that this word Shabbos doesn't always mean, yom, doesn't always mean Shabbos. It can also mean Yom Tov. You know, so if someone by accident comes over to you on Yom Tov and says, good Shabbos, you know, it's okay, because... You know, Chazal say that Shabbos sometimes means Yom Tov, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, however, the Baitusim did not. They read this literally, and they said, no, we don't do the Omer ritual. We shouldn't bring this first sheaf carbon um, after the first day of Pesach. We should bring it when? Next Sunday. So if you look at like this year, this year, yesterday would have been the day, the second day of Yom Tov here, but the first day of Chol Moed in Israel that would have been the day that the Omer ritual was done. That's when the Omer Karban was brought. Um, the Baitusim, they felt that, no, we have to wait until the next, after the next Shabbos. So the next Shabbos is this coming Shabbos, because uh, Pesach started on Sunday, on Motzei Shabbos. So these Baitusim would say, no, you have to wait until Shabbos, and then you do it the next day. Um, and this has really significant implications. Um, most, the, the largest implication or one of the biggest being that um, the fact that this ritual was done on Shabbos, even if it was Shabbos, the Shluchei Basin were allowed to violate Shabbos and do what's an Av Malacha, Ketzira, it's like it's right there in the Mishnah that you can't do that activity on Shabbos, but, you know, for a biblical rule can, the, the, the Gzer Sakasov can say that we should override Shabbos and do this mitzvah. We have other mitzvahs like that too, like doing a bris on Shabbos. Um, so the, the Baitusim would say, no, you shouldn't do it this Shabbos. You're violating Shabbos. You're a bunch of Sh Sabbath violators. But the rabbi said, no, this is our Masorah, that Shabbos means the day after Yom Tov, and, and we're going to do it. And that's why they had this whole big fanfare in order to emphasize the fact that uh, they were following the, the Masorah and that they weren't and they, they, they were steering away from uh, the explanation of the, of the Baitusim. So this ritual took on very um, uh, you know, important like political significance because it, it showed that uh, the rabbis were, were the ones to follow. Also, the date of Shavuos depends on when the Omer is brought. Uh, right after the biblical passage that we had earlier, it says, Usfartem lachami macharas ha-shabbas, miyom aviyachem esa omer tenufa, sheba shabbasos timimos tiyeno. This is the omer that we're in right now. These 49 days that we're counting, that doesn't start, you know, we don't have a date to start it. We don't have a date to finish it. We just know that it's, it begins with the macharat ha-shabbat. Um, so this had very grave, uh, you know, significant, the significance for the calendar, depending on which opinion you would follow. If you would follow the, follow the Baitusim, Shavuos would be a week later this year. Um, if you follow the rabbis, it's going to be you know, on, on the date that we have. So it's a very, very important um, ritual that took on extra significance because of the uh, political situation during the Second Temple period. This was also something that had really grave economic um, importance, this mitzvah. Um, I'll show a couple sources that talk about the economic impact of the fact that we can't eat the grain, the new grain, the new crop, until we bring this carbon. You know, um, right after they finished that ritual, 
the Mishnah says, Mishakara pa Omer, after they brought that Omer, Yotzin Umotzin Shuk Yushalayim Shuhu Male Kemach Vakali. The people would go out of the Beis HaMikdash after the whole ceremony was done. And then they would find the marketplace full of flour and parched grain. Some say, Shalom Berton Chachamim, Divir Rabbi Meir, Divir Rabbi Huda Omer, Berton Chachamim Hayuosin, is depending on, you know, did they want people dealing with this new grain before it was actually mutter to eat it? According to Rabbi Meir, they didn't, but according to Rabbi Huda, um, they did. It was, it was okay with certain provisos. But uh, you know, when they would come out, the marketplace would already be full. So you, cl you clearly see that there's been, like people have been either storing this stuff or they've been definitely waiting to have it come to the marketplace so that people could purchase it and consume it. Um, further evidence of its economic significance comes from, for those of you who are learning Daf Yomi, uh, just a few Daf Yomi ago, the Gemara talks about how uh, the intercalation of the of the of the calendar, like the adding of a month, would would depend on this mitzvah. Um, let's see if I can find that source here. Um, yeah. So what was going? This is just the background of what's going on in Shkalim. The the Mishnah in Shkalim says that. Uh, at first, the agents of the court would uproot and cast um, kilayim that people were having in their field in front of the violators. Kilayim are, um, you know, there are certain different types of plants you're not allowed to grow together. And if you do grow them together, they're uh, forbidden. So you have to uproot them. So the quote unquote, you know, the agents of the court, the mashkichim of the day would go around to different fields and inspect for kilayim. And, you know, if the age, originally when the agents of the court would go around, they would, and find these kilayim, the people who, who had it in their field will doubly rejoice. That's what it says here. One, that others were weeding their fields for them, which is, you know, great. The mashgiach is doing two things for me. Um, and they would uh, derive benefit from these diverse kinds. They would uh, be able to feed them to their animals, the, the Mepharshim say. When the transgressors increased, when people uh, were not following the rules, when they saw they weren't following the rules, they would cast them into the road. And even so, the owners would still rejoice because at least the mashkiach is weeding my field. So therefore, the sages instituted that the entire field should be declared ownerless. So this ability for the sages to be declared ownerless is a um, you know, very strong power of Bastin. And the Gemara derives it from the fact that Bastin can intercalate the year. They can add a month to the year. And that has an effect on what produce is considered um, Shemitah produce or not. Um, and then as a comment on that situation, the Gemara says, and the Gemara quotes, it says, one may not intercalate the year neither in the sabbatical year nor in the year after the sabbatical year. In the year after, in the year of the sabbatical year is the reason why this price is quoted because um, you want to prove that Basin has the ability to do that. Okay, but once we know that they have the ability to do that, why did they also say that you can't intercalate the year in the uh, at the year after the sabbatical year? What's the reason for that? Rabbi Bun said says not to increase the prohibition of new grain. They didn't want to increase the prohibition of the new grain, which means they didn't want to make chadash the fact that we have to do chadash more difficult for people. If you would add a month to Adar then that would just increase the amount of time you have to wait before you can use this new grain. Um, I only really brought that source because people who are doing Dafyomi may have seen it. It's also quoted in, um, in Sanhedrin. The Gemara says, ma'avrin es hashana bishne ra'avon. In a much simpler, um, in a much simpler way, the Gemara says that the sages said that we don't add a month to the year during years of famine. This is Rabbi Steinzelt's uh, explanation that I pulled from Safari. I said, when grain is scarce, intercalating the year would exacerbate food shortages and delay uh, by delaying the Omer offering, which is brought in Nisan. So prolonging the period during which the new crop, uh, prolonging that period would be forbidden. Um, interestingly, the Gemara here actually quotes, um, it quotes a, a Pasuk in Malachim as to uh, 
you know, th that relates to this issue as a proof that we that we shouldn't do it. So this is a um, a long a long-standing minna going back to the time of Elisha, which is when this this pasuk is quoted. So you know, basically the past of of Chadash is that is a very very important thing. Pardon my uh, spelling errors here. Um, in biblical and temple times, this was a a mitzvah of significant, very significant religious, political, and economic importance. It was um, it would define it, it was a defining uh, ritual to say that we're keeping the Masorah properly. It defined when Shavuos was going to be, and it's a very important economic issue because it really it affected the way Chazal would um, think about when they would change the calendar. Like we have a principle that Pesach is supposed to be the Chodesh Aviv, but even uh, but, but Chazal would keep in mind the uh, the economic situation and see that it would be a bad idea to intercalate the year to add a month during a year of famine, and they would maybe let Pesach slide a little bit to ease the um, food shortage situation on people. Okay, so that's the past of Kharash, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if people have any, but I can now move on to sort of the present or basically the post-temple times until today. What are some of the issues that have come up regarding this mitzvah, this halacha? So the first question is really directly after the temple. Um, because We'll see here in this uh, Gemara quote that I quote from Anachos that they really had to figure out what they were supposed to do. Mishakar Omer. Normally, when the Omer is brought in the base of Mikdash, Hutara Chadash Miyad. The Chadash was permitted immediately. And the people who lived far away from Yerushalayim, they would be allowed to eat the new grain from until the end of the day, from midday, right? The, uh, the grain would become permitted immediately after the, after the ritual was done. That's why people stormed into the marketplace to buy things. But what if you lived a little further away from Yushalayim? They didn't have such great communication back then. So you would just wait until midday. Either the Mishnah says or the Gemara says that the Kohanim was Rizim and they would never delay the Omer that late uh, beyond Chatzot. So once you waited for Chatzot Hayom, then you can assume that the Omer was brought and you can eat the new grain. Nishachar Beis Amigdash, when the Beis Amigdash was destroyed, it wasn't exactly clear what they should do. Hitkin Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai, Shayyehe Yom Hanaf Kulo Asr. The Mishnah says that uh, Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai, the leader of the Jewish people in, um, in Yavna, he made a takana that the entire day of Yom Hanaf, the day of waving, which is this day after the first day of Pesach, would be Asr. Rabbi Huda then asked, why are you making this takana? That's a very strange takana. Torah Isn't it already known that it's Asr min ha-Torah? ad etzem hayom azeh. The Pasuk says, you know, until this day. The Gemara has a whole discussion, like, does this mean ad the ad bechlal or ad velo ad bechlal? Does it mean up until this day, or does it mean up until this day and including this day? Um, so from that we get uh, different uh, explanations as to what Rabbi Yochanan really meant when he made his takana. Because if you follow Rabbi Huda's reasoning, which is that we obviously have to wait until the end of the day, uh, Rabbi Yochanan's takana seems quite superfluous. So there's actually two explanations that the Gemara gives, at least. Um, I, I bring them over here. The first one is really quite inspiring. It's Mishakar uh, Beit HaMikdash, Hitkin Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Shayhe Yomanaf Kulo Asr, my taima. What's the reason? Meheira Yibana Beit HaMikdash. Because Rabbi Yochanan was such an optimist and so hopeful that the Beit HaMikdash was going to be rebuilt very soon. And he would say that uh, you can't eat the Omer until either the carbon Omer is brought or when this day begins. I'll take a step back because I probably wasn't clear. According to this original, according to this opinion, 
um, there's two times, two potential times for when the Omer becomes permitted. One time is when the Omer is brought. That's when the base of is there and we're doing the rituals. The other time, which is when there's no rituals on a biblical level, according to this opinion, um, the Chada should be permitted daybreak on that day. Ad below ad bichlal. Up until that day is when the Chadash is also, but once you hit that day, as long as the carbon is not going to be brought, then the, the Chadash is Mater. But then you can ask the question, well, what happens if, um, you know, there's no base on Megdash at seven o'clock in the morning, but then at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, there is a base on Megdash and we're bringing the, we're, we're ready to bring the Omer. So then you sort of jumped the gun a little bit. You started to eat, um, you start to eat your chadash, but really there's a chance to bring the Omer um, if you have this really, really optimistic attitude and we have a really good construction crew. Um, so because of that possibility, the Rav Yochanan Mazakai made a takana and said, no, we should all wait. We should all be optimists. We should all say, Mishakar um, Beis HaMikdash. Meheira Yibana Beis HaMikdash. We should wait until the end of the day, just in case the base of Middash is going to be built. Um, the benefits of optimism are, I think, well known by most. Um, another answer, which I think many take is, is maybe the real Maskana of the Gemara, is after this whole discussion, my Hitkin, what does it mean, Hitkin, even though we have the whole Pasuk of Rabbi Yehuda that says ad etzimayomazeh. Really, everybody holds ad 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 bechlal. That day is is um, considered part of the part of the halacha, and we need to keep we need to refrain from eating the chadash grain until after that entire day is over. So it means darash uh, vehitkin. It means that there was some um, ambiguity as to what how the pasuk should be read, and what the halacha should be. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka used the powers of um, you know, the 13 midos or whatever, whatever it is, his powers of uh, deciding what the Torah is really meaning to say and paskind that you're, um, that the chadash really stays also until the, end of the, until the end of that day. And he's really in complete agreement with Rabbi Yehuda. So those are two options. On the one, one, one option is that really um, that day should be permitted, uh, the chadash should be permitted from the start of the day. But because hopefully the Beis HaMidosh will be rebuilt, we, uh, we wait until the end of the day. Or really everyone agrees, it's just Darash uh, V'Hitkin. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan had to, had to be Dorish the Pasuk for the final time and, and passing that this is the way it's going to be. Um, and then it's really, uh, it's really us or even the entire day. Okay, after that, after that initial, that's from like right when the Beis HaMidrash was destroyed, that was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Then there's a machlokas about um, what to do about Kharash outside of Eretz Yisrael. And this is uh, brought down in the Mishnah. We have two Mishnayas that are at the core of this issue. One of them is very clear, it's a mission on Arla. It's talking about some of the other rules that uh, some of, uh, it's talking about Arla and some other things that have to do with, um, you know, the agricultural laws of Israel. But it uh, has a very clear line. It says, Ha-chadash asr min ator Chadash, new grain is forbidden biblically in any place. So if I would ask you, after you just read this Mishnah in Arla, is Chadash permitted anywhere in the world before we bring the carbon Omer or before the day that the Omer is supposed to be brought? The answer seems to be no. Chadash asamina Torah b'chomakom. On the other hand, you jump over to the Mishnah and Kiddushin, it's not so simple. There, the Tanakama, the first, uh, the first opinion in the Mishnah says, kol mitzvah shehi tuli ba'aretz eno no heges ela ba'aretz. All mitzvot that are land-based, that are Israel-based, only apply in Israel. Shemitah, Yovel, etc. V'she'en otlui ba'aretz, and mitzvot that don't apply in the aretz, no heges, bein ba'aretz, bein b'chutz la'aretz. 
I don't know, tefillin applies whether you're in Israel or outside of Israel. There's lots of examples of what that would be, except chutz min ha'orla ve'kilayim. The Mishnah gives, the first opinion gives two examples of what's an exception to that rule. Orla and kilayim. Kilayim is when you are mixing two different species, and Arla is the first couple of years of um, produce from a fruit tree are, are forbidden, I think, to refresh my memory on that one. Okay, then there's a second opinion, which is Rabbi Elazar Omer, Af Min HaKadosh, another, ex, another, and this means, another exception to the rule is Chadash. Rabbi Elazar believes that Chadash also applies Bein Ba'aretz, Bein B'chutz Aretz. The Tanakhama in this Mishnah says, seems to say that it doesn't apply because he left it out of his list. And Rabbi Elazar says that it does apply and it's forbidden. If you would just see this Mishnah in Kiddushin, then you might come out with a different conclusion from the Mishnah in Arla. If you just look at this Mishnah, you see, well, the Tanakhama says, which generally represents, you know, the Chachamim, the majority opinion, that says, you know, and you know what? Chadash is not in the list. So Chadash would not apply. Outside the land of Israel, Chadash doesn't, doesn't apply. Rabbi Lazar, though, he's a minority opinion. He would say Chadash, uh, Chadash does apply. But that's the opposite of the implication that you get from this mission on Arlo, which just says, it seems like it's the majority opinion for everyone. Chadash is forbidden. Um, everywhere. This does get to be, you know, the core of some of the issues that come up amongst the later Rishonim and Achronim, how to understand the interplay between these two Mishnayis, which one is dominant uh, and which one isn't. Looking at the Gemara, the Gemara back in Menachos, it gives a three-way machlokas about Chadash um, in Chutzlaretz. I'll, I'll give these three read, three uh, options. Option number one, Rav Papa and Rav Huna and Rav Yeshua ate Chadash on the night of the 16th. He ate Chadash on the night of the 16th because they held that, so that is right after, um, right after the second day, right after the second day of Pesach, because they held Chadash outside of Israel is rabbinic, and we are not concerned about a case of doubt. What's going on here? They had real Sveika de Yoma back in their day, where they didn't know what day was Yom Tov, what day wasn't Yom Tov. So the question is, okay, so on the 15th day of Pesach is day number one. The second day of Pesach is uh, day number two, it's Sveika de Yoma. So maybe it's the first day of Pesach, maybe it's the second. And then we come to day number three of Pesach, which maybe it's the second day, maybe it's the first. So ultimately, he held that because Chadash is only a rabbinic concern outside of Israel, he doesn't have to worry about the doubt of, you know, should I eat, should I wait until the end of the 17th day in order to eat Chadash or not? So that's why he was able, he ate it on the 16th because he felt that Chadash outside of Israel was rabbinic. The next opinion, Rabban Ve Ravashi Achlu Safra. I read the English. The rabbis of Ravashi school ate on the morning of the 17th. They held that Chadash outside of Israel is biblical. But Rabbi Yochanan's decree about waiting until the end of the day was rabbinic and was not enacted in a case of doubt. They felt that even though Chadash itself outside of Israel is biblical, the fact that we have to wait until the end of the second, uh, that we have to wait until the end of what might be the third day of Yom Tov of, of, of Pesach, that uh, Rabbi Yochanan did not make his decree. When Rabbi Yochanan made his decree, it was only for a biblical case in Israel. But if it was um, outside of Israel, then he's not concerned about that. So they were able to eat earlier. And then finally, Ravina said that my mother told me that my, mo my father would not eat Chadash until the evening of the 17th, the night before the 18th because he agreed with Rabbi Yehuda and was concerned in the case of doubt. So we end up with, he thinks not only is Chadash a outside of Israel, a biblical issue, but also he felt that uh, he agreed with the 
version of Rabbi Yochanan, uh, of Rabbi Yochanan Sakana, that he was actually just enacting the biblical, he was just reinforcing the biblical explanation, the, the true big, biblical explanation that you need to, that when there's no base on Megdash, you need to wait until the end of uh, the day of waving. And if you're in Chutz Aretz, there's Sveika de Yoma, you have to be, um, you have to be stringent. So he would wait until the end of the 17th day because he felt that it was, um, you know, Del Raisa all the way through. So we end up with three different opinions here uh, amongst the uh, Afro, amongst the, um, amongst the, the rabbis of the Gemara. One, that Chodesh outside of Israel is rabbinic and that there's, you know, we're not really concerned in a case of doubt because we say, Safik Darabon and Lakula. Another is that out, uh, Chadash outside of Israel is biblical, but Rabbi Yochanan's decree about the second day of Yom Tov, that wasn't, um, wasn't uh, declared during the, um, w- when there's a suffix. And then we have Ravina's position, which is the most stringent, is that not only is, um, not only is Chadash outside of Israel a biblical issue, but also Rabbi Yochanan's Takana was really just a reinforcement of, of the biblical rule, and you'd have to wait fully until the end of the first day of Cholamoid in Chutz Aretz, which would be right now, in order to eat your Chadash. Okay, so that's how, there is some, you know, there's some varying opinions in the Mishnah and, and in the uh, Amor Rhymes. Now is going to look a little at the Mishonim and Achronim. I'll, uh, I'll uh, we'll dive into it and see what we get. So I just wanted to look first at the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch talks about um, Chadash in two places. One in, um, you know, Hilchos Svirsa Omer, Lel Sheni Shal Pesach and Svirsa Omer. The very last halacha of that sif is, Asr Lecho Chadash Af Bizman Hazer. You're not allowed to eat you know, the new grain, even nowadays. Ben Lechi, Ben Lechem, Ben Kelly, Ben Carmel, whatever form it, it's in. Ad Chilas Lel Yud Ches Ben Nisan. That's until right now, until the uh, night of the 18th. In and Uve Eretz Yisrael Ad Chilas Yud Zayin Ben Nisan. So he's saying, he's poskening that, you know, by implication, he's not saying he doesn't say the word Chutz Laaretz, but he's being very obvious that Chadash applies in Chutz Laaretz, and he's even more. Um, Explicit in in Yoridea, where he says and here here's just really a rehash of the what, what he said in um, in Orachayim, but then he's very clear. Aser Isur Hachadash No Heg Bein Ba'aretz Bein Bechutz La'aretz. The Isur of Chadash applies in Chutz La'aretz in Eretz Yisrael Bein Bishal Yisrael Bein Bishal Ovi Kochavim. Whether it's Jewish person's grain, whether it's a non-Jewish person's grain. Um, that's what he says. He says that it's it's completely author. And why does he say that? The Shulchan Aruch surveyed, you know, all of his um, predecessors, but he says that he really takes the major opinions of the Rif, the Rambam, and the Rush, and whoever has the um, usually he follows the majority of those three opinions. Normally, it's tilted towards the Svardim, which is why the Rama wrote his whole gloss on the Shulchan Aruch. But in this case, you know, just uh, took the line from the Aruch Shulchan. Who's, who sums it up for us? Harif v'harambam v'harash pasku k'rabi Elazar mishum distam. This is why uh, the the Aruch Hashulchan quote notes that the Rush, the Rambam, and the Rif are all in agreement that uh, we passing like Rabbi Elazar, who said in the Mishnah and Kedushin that Chadash is one of those things that applies bein ba'aretz bein b'chutz la'aretz. We passing like him, and it gives a reasoning. Because that Mishnah in Arla is a Stam Mishnah. It's a, you know, it's a, you know, plain Mishnah. It doesn't have a Machlokas. Um, and we go like that Stam Mishnah. That's what we Paskin like. That's what these big heavy hitters, the Rif, the Rambam, and the Rush, all Paskin like. So just looking at this, Chadash looks like it applies everywhere. Um, and if you're following, you may have an issue on our hands. Because I don't know about you and I, but I certainly don't, I'm not mocked about Chadash. I don't know if my grain, if the grain that I'm consuming, you know, 
was uh, all harvested after or before, I mean, all uh, grew after or before the, um, the Yom Hanafa, the, you know, the, the second day of Pesach, or in our case, the third day of Pesach. So the Ramah comes in and he has a very long gloss in this case and says that it's actually not as simple as the Shulchan Aruch puts it. And he says that uh, nevertheless, all intermediate grain is permitted after Pesach because of a double doubt. Perhaps it comes from the previous year's grain. You know, maybe any grain that I have in front of me comes from the previous year. Or even if it came from this year's grain, nevertheless, perhaps it took, perhaps it took root before the Omer. So Dharma says, you know, we can, uh, we can be lenient because we have a sveik sveika, a double doubt situation. Normally, a regular suffake on a do raisa issue is something which uh, you have to be machmer about, you have to be stringent. But if it's a sveik sveika, if there's a double doubt, then we can be lenient. So the Rama is saying here that um, really it does apply. Chadash does apply b'chutzlars, but we have an out because we can say that there's a, a, a sveik sveika. There's a double suffix. Now, many people you know, take issue with the double suffix that the, that the Ramah is trying to uh, use here and have other explanations. I have here the, uh, the Taz, who gives really what I'm told is the like core explanation for how most, most people operate these days. Uh, and I, it's a very long Taz, and I just highlighted a few sections here. It says, um, based on what he's saying here is that uh, to the preamble to this highlighted section is that because there is some, um, you know, there are two Mishnayas that give different implications, that gives us a little bit of wiggle room to, to Paskin um, in desperate times. He says, basically, the preamble to this is because we have some, um, because we have some uh, uncertainty based on these two different, different Mishnayas, if so, we can rule in these locations that, that it is a desperate time and the lives of the people depend on drinking beer from barley and oats. And we can rely on the Tanakama on this extenuating circumstance um, because there is some doubt as to the Pesach Halacha and the mission of the Gemara. The mission and the Gemara are not extremely explicit about what, I mean, some would argue, but according to the Taz, at least, it's not entirely explicit that um, what, what the Pesach Halacha from the, uh, from the mission and the Gemara should be. And that gives us the, at least him, in what he calls a desperate time, if I spell it correctly, uh, in, a, in a desperate time to Paskin like the Tanakama, who is not maybe what the Rambam, the Riff, and the Rush Paskin like, but because it's an extenuating circumstance, um, felt that he can rely on it. He gives a little bit of reasoning um, as to why maybe the other Paskin Paskin the other way. And the Paskin who are not concerned about extenuating circumstances, because in their land, there was no problem whatsoever as the climate is warm. And many years go by where there's no Chadash problem. But in the lands that are cold through Pesach time, they would definitely agree that we can rely on the lenient opinion because the lives of the people rely on it because their primary drink is beer and similar things. Um, and there are also some opinions who say that Chadash doesn't apply regarding the produce of non-Jews. So based on these, uh, you know, the combination of a Shas Adchak and that there are some opinions that Chadash doesn't, um, doesn't apply in certain situations, you know, the Taz says here that uh, we're no hate to be mekel. And they were no hate to be mekel for many, many years. And it became the, um, you know, the modus operandi of the people. For hundreds of years, uh, they were eating chadash grain. And uh, like the community basically passed in that, you know, chadash chutzla and chutzla arets, we're gonna pass in like the minority opinion in this case, the lenient opinion in this case, because it's extenuating circumstances. I mean, this is something which, you know, I was looking around, even um, in some of the early coronavirus chuvas about listening to the Megillah over, over microphones and things, which normally we would say, you know, even this year, I think we said generally like, let's try not to rely on it. But last year, when it was a very extenuating circumstance, you know, in some of the OU publications, they wrote, um, you know, 
there are some um, lenient opinions that say you can listen to the Megillah over, over a microphone, over the phone, over Zoom. So because it's an extenuating circumstance, we'll, we'll allow it this year. I mean, hopefully our situation is going to get better and it's not going to stick. I think this year already people said, you know, try not to listen to um, Zoom over the microphone if you can. Um, but this kind of thing where people were eating this grain, this new grain, that was going on for years and years and years. And um, just on the note on the beer that he keeps mentioning, um, you know, back in the days before people had an understanding of you know, microbes and things, water was putrid. Water that was just sitting around would, would grow things and it would be disgusting and it would make people sick. But people would drink beer all the time. They knew that uh, somehow through the fermentation process, it um, removes some of these impurities and you know, they may get drunk, but at least they're not gonna get sick. So um, that's why drinking beer was very important for, um, for the Jewish community. And a lot of people were in the business of producing beer and uh, had beer businesses, which has brought about the whole, you know, modern day uh, Mechir uh institution because people had to sell this beer that they were using and drinking for, um, for Pesach. So this is uh, well, one approach that the Taz has that basically the community, because of extending the circumstances many years ago, poskened that and we're going to be lenient about Chadash and Chutzlaretz. So on these next couple slides, I have the, I didn't get a chance to translate it, the opinion of the, the Mishnah Bura that he brings down, which is that it's really fascinating to read. He says that, um, I'll sort of summarize it now, but he basically says that, you know, the Rama said that there's this fake sveka, maybe it's not from last year's grain, or maybe it's, uh, this year's grain, but it was actually took root before the um, before before Pesach. In which case, you can rely on the on the on the sake sake and be lenient. But the Mishabura says, you know, the um, that may have been true in the Ramaz time, but in our time, you know, we have a we, we know for a fact that okay, certain wheat is grown in Cheshvan, and all of that wheat is you know quote unquote winter wheat, and it all is rooted well before Pesach. So it's not gonna be a Chadash problem by the time it, it's ready. It's gonna be ready after Pesach. But uh, other grains are definitely grown during the spring and during the summer. And it's definitely gonna be a problem. Also, we know that uh, like there's no suffake there anymore. There's no fake sveka there anymore to rely on. Also, the, um, he quotes, and I, I wish I had highlighted, but he talks about you know, people bringing in grain in iron boxes on iron chariots, um, you know, by trains, people were shipping grain back and forth. There's uh, intercontinental trade going on that really removes the suffix that the Ramo was relying on. So the, the, the Mishnah Bura concludes basically by saying that uh, really people should be, um, people should be, should, should be careful about, about Chadash if possible. Um, he does say, like, look, we can't, uh, we can't knock the people who are lenient. You know, they have who to rely on. There are many great people who ate chadash and who passed in that chadash was okay, and we can't knock them. But you know, people should be should should try to be um, should try to be machner. And that's where sort of the approaches that two different approaches. One that you know the community basically had to say that it's okay, so we're just going to view it as okay. Or it was always a bidi eved. And we should keep in mind that it's a BD Evid and we should try to um, we should try to get out of this BD Evid situation um, as soon as we have the ability to do that. So now we come to um, I guess some something about nowadays, Khadash nowadays, 2021. You know, this is some data about what the kind the kind of wheat that's grown in the United States. There is a very significant winter crop of wheat. I honestly, I never really knew how to read these bar charts that have things stacked on top of each other. But um, there's also lots of spring wheat and durum wheat and other wheats. They're growing different times of the year. And you know, winter wheat is not a problem. Winter wheat is, so it's, 
relatively low gluten content. So it's used for things like um, cakes and cookies and stuff that don't really need to like rise and be fluffy. So generally those kind of things are not a, a, a huge problem, but spring wheat and durum wheat is used for bread and pasta. And that can be, that's definitely, um, you know, chadash, uh, a chadash thing. Also, we have like data of where things are grown and when they're grown throughout the entire country. Like nothing seems to be really grown in, in Massachusetts, but you know, winter wheat is grown here. Where's the spring wheat? Does this talk about it? I guess the soft wheat is the uh, spring wheat grown in the Washington area. Um, Durham wheat is for the pastas. That's up in the Dakotas and Montana. So wheat is grown all over the place, and we the USDA has good data on what's going on with all of this wheat. So if you're following the Mr. Burroughs line of reasoning, you're think you might be thinking, you know, we now have a lot of data. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe there's no suffix there anymore for us to rely on. Um, the OU's official stance, this is from uh, their website in 2019, is that the OU does not enforce a Yashon status of products under its supervision in Chutzla Arts, basing itself on the prevalent custom as explained above, which is that we should be lenient, or the community has been lenient. Nevertheless, the OU does assist whenever possible those who wish to avoid Kharash. Um, and they work with certain mills to monitor them on a limited basis. This limited basis is only getting larger and larger there's a really a growing market for um, Khadash food. Um, just a little bit of a timeline. Before the 1930s, there was actually no Khadash issue in the US at all because all wheat was stored for very long periods over a year so that it would something would happen to it um, for, for it to be um, ideal for baking. Ravan Soloveitchik, when he first became a mashkiach for um, Stripes, the matzo company, he went to go investigate the issue and he saw that in the 1950s, wheat at that point was already no longer being stored because whatever chemical change would happen over this long period during the 1930s, they were, they started bleaching the wheat and it would age chemically and it would happen very fast and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be storing it for long periods anymore. So he, he imposed on Stripes to make it, um, that it would have to be chadash if they wanted his hechsher. It would have to be Yashan only, only use old wheat if they wanted his hechsher. And because of that, for many years, he only ate matzah because he couldn't really trust the, uh, any bread around that it was, um, that wasn't a chadash problem. Concern grew in the water community during you know, the 1970s as the US started to export lots of wheat to the Soviet Union. And today, you know, since then, until today, we have a six page, a guide to chadash that you can buy or download, it says it's $12 on the cover. In it, it has you know, a list of like all the mills in the country and whoever else they were able to get information from, all of the catering halls and restaurants all around the country that say that uh, they only use yashan or old flour in all of their, um, in all of their products. So they you know, are there to help people who want to be mock bid for this kind of, uh, for this kind of thing. Um, so there is a little bit of attention, you know, on the one hand, there are definitely sources and it, the, the, the big post skim that the Shulchan Aruch relies upon are saying that uh, you know, Chadash is Asr in Chutz Aretz. On the other hand, we have a long standing minog in our community to not be strict for it. So me being the engineer problem solver, I was trying to look for what can we do about this? And I looked in at, at the root of the problem, which is actually the root. Um, this is where the puns start and they're gonna be, all be bad. Um, the Mishnah says in Chala, Chamisha Dvarim Chayavim Bechala, there are five different grains that um, are, these are the five grains that you, that you are required to give Chala. These are the five grains that come up throughout, um, these are the five grains that come up throughout halacha, the five grains you can make matzah out of, et cetera. Um, you know, chitin so'or and kusme and shibola shuol the shifon, there's a discussion about what those are, but that's for a definitely a different different talk by somebody else. 
Hare Elochayim Bechala, Umitztarfen Zemze, the Isurin Bechadash, Milifne HaPesach, all these things become Asur before Pesach, Umiliktor with Nea Omer, and you can't even harvest them really before the Omer. However, Vim Hishrishu Kodem La Omer, Omer Matiran. If they become, if they take root before the Omer, then the Omer um, permits them. Vim Lav, Vim Lav, and if they don't take root before the Omer, then you have to wait for the next Omer. The issue is that the root cause of Chadash is that the root has to take root. So um, if we could somehow do something about that root, maybe we could have a solution. And here's my solution, which is called perennial wheat. Okay, perennial wheat is based on the idea for perennial wheat that I can, it's based on this, um, the nopyrum intermedium, which is commonly known as an intermediate wheatgrass. Wheatgrasses in general are perennial. So there is this existing plant, not a botanist, but this exists, which is perennial compared to wheat, which is annual. And you know this group called the Land Institute has been running trials with a wheatgrass called Kernza that they've you know, named Kernza to show that it can be used as a multifunctional crop yielding various commodities, and it has lots and lots of benefits. So it's, um, it's an annual, you're going to replant it every year, you would save the, you know, the entire environment because you're not gonna have to plow so much, you don't have to rip up the soil so much, it actually replenishes the soil, um, unlike normal wheat, which sort of like just grabs all the nutrients from the soil, et cetera. There are some issues with it, which, you know, this is a picture of, wheat versus wheatgrass. I'll just blow that up a little bit if it's easier to see, which is that this is what a wheat grow, what, what a, like a wheat root looks like um, in September. And as it develops over time, it's, it's enormous. And the uh, wheatgrass is a lot smaller. So it has some issues, which is that it, um, the way they put it in some of the papers that I read about this is that it's a, it's a much, it's a much, um, it's a very immature crop. Like wheat has been, like they say, people, humans made a huge mistake thousands of years ago, according to this land institute. They start to cultivate wheat and they've been cultivating wheat for thousands of years. There's you know, different wheat strains that are optimized for different environments all over the world. Um, and it's a extremely efficient crop. I don't have the number here, but like, Let's say you get a thousand pound, a thousand ton. I don't know how much. A thousand. It's like a thousand to one ratio. The the yield on um, this kind of uh, wheat that's been developed for thousands of years versus this wheatgrass, which they've been looking at since you know two thousand one. Um, Yet, say would would hydroponics solve the problem also? So I don't think hydroponics would solve the problem because. Um, and I haven't listened, I know it's definitely an option, but I think it's still, there's still a root forming. And if it's, uh, if it's forming every year, you could say that, um, you can say that it's, it's still reforming. But in this case, it's an but it's annual. it's not in the ground. Root. It's not in the ground. It's in so water. That, it, it is in water. That, that could be also be an option. I'm not, uh, not opposed to other solutions to the Chadash um, problem as I've posed it. Uh, but one, uh, one obvious issue with this particular plant is Kernza, this wheatgrass that they're using, then it's not actually wheat. It would just be considered something like, it wouldn't be one of the five grains. It's, it would be like quinoa today, you know, it's a grain-ish kind of thing, but you know, no one would ever say that it's one of the five grains and we couldn't use it for matzah or anything like that. The interesting thing people have been doing is they've been uh, attempting to cross this wheatgrass with, they've hybridized, I guess, this wheatgrass with wheat. It's been ongoing since 2001. Uh, there are some benefits. You could, could potentially get more disease resistance and more calories out of it. Most hybrids with normal wheat lose the perenniality feature, which is very interesting um, as they do this. 
but there are some crosses with durum wheat that do maintain perenniality. So this wheat, durum wheat, which is used for pastas, um, it looks like they're having some success, at least according to my limited research, they're having some success getting this to, uh, to work. So it would be interesting to, and, and that what they, their hope is that, you know, current um, biological engineering tools will give them a, I guess the boost they need to catch up the thousands of years of, of uh, human cultivation of, of wheat. And they can, uh, you know, however they, however they, all the methods that they have available to modify genes and create different variants. Uh, and they're doing that today. They take, they, they cross these, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're putting in, you know, wheat grass DNA into the wheat. They're irradiating the, the wheat in order to try to get it to be perennial. They're doing all these really interesting things in order to try to grow something. Um, yeah. In, in order to grow something that would be perennial. And this could be a solution because if you had fields and fields and fields of wheat, the first year of this perennial wheat, the first year, yes, it would be a chadash issue, but then ongoing, potentially, there wouldn't be any chadash issue because the roots were always there and it's just growing new fruit, so to speak, at the top. And you know, there are some questions that come out of this, which is like, is it still wheat? Um, have we taken the wheat and the fact that we've made it perennial made it no longer wheat? Like imagine if, you know, let's jump ahead. I don't know how many years they're gonna work on this, but let's say 20 years and they're able to come at, come to you with something that looks like wheat, smells like wheat, tastes like wheat, looks like it becomes comets like wheat, has the same chemical process, but it's just a perennial plant. What would we do with it? Is it still considered wheat? Does the bracha change? Is this now like a tree that is, uh, you know, an a, a, a perennially there and growing fruit, and we would make ha'etz on, on our uh, wheat berries as opposed to adama. Um, would it still become chametz? Presumably it would still become chametz because chametz is a uh, more of a chemical process. But if it's only those five grains, and this maybe is not no longer one of those five grains, maybe it, um, maybe it, it wouldn't. Um, and again, as, as I see William asked in the, uh, in the comments, you know, is it mutter to do this? Is maybe this some sort of a kilayim type of messing with, you know, messing with nature a little too much that uh, God doesn't want it to do this? And then finally, would we even want to do this? You know, the if you take this to its, um, you know, if you take this to its most extreme, you know, there would no longer be chadash under the sun anymore, which is the title of this talk, because all of the wheat would be perennial. And there would never be a chadash. There would there would never be any chadash anymore. So that is some of the questions that uh, we need to talk about. I guess regarding this uh, perennial wheat as it comes. I haven't really spoken to any uh, you know major kashrut organizations what they would think about this, but I think it's a, a very interesting option for potentially, at least in chutzla aretz. If we wanted to help, you know, currently we're all we're following, at least many of us, I am following the lenient opinion, but it could be that uh, we wouldn't have to anymore if there was no problem of Kharash to begin with because there was no Kharash anywhere. So with that, um, thank you very much. Happy to take in any questions and modem simcha. Any quick question? Anyone? Uh, we're already over nine. Feel free to sign off if uh, it's late for you. But as you can see, said any quick question or comment? Okay, he explained everything to us. Okay, all right. Good night, everyone. Good moed. Yeshikoach. Yeshikoach. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Jordy, no questions, really? Okay.
What about Ellie? You're going to have some questions. I just did. I put my question in the chat. Oh, I didn't see. Sorry. Where's Rabbi Ellie's question? In addition to fulfilling the mitzvah, what would be the spiritual practice of growth that could come from taking Kaddish more seriously? I mean, any mitzvah, well, taking Kaddish seriously and fulfilling any mitzvah is, uh, is obviously wonderful. And when you look deep into the sources, it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to deny what, if history had developed differently, if people didn't grow up in, uh, you know, colder climates, how would Allah have developed? Would we have been more, you know, would we have all have been in the Rambam, Rif, and Rush school? And there would have been no school of the, uh, of the, of the Rama, for example, or, or the Taz? Maybe there wouldn't be. So there's, a, there's an element of like really doing the right thing. And that's what, uh, there's definitely a strong to, element there striving to fully live in and the more mitzvahs we can at the same time at the same time and you see this in the people who who advocated so to speak for Khadash, um or were strict about it Ravon Soloveitchik did not impose it on anybody else so if they wanted him to be if he wanted if they wanted him to be because they had great respect really to have they really had great respect for the previous generations and what they held um so if he wanted if they wanted him to be the mashkiach yeah they'd have to do it his way but he wasn't going to and he didn't like go and publicize and say everybody must do this and when even in the 70s when this uh you know Khadash guide first came out apparently um Ryakov Kamenetsky you know gave the person who was doing it like very strict instructions you know you will not like push this and tell other people that they're eating trafe, et cetera. Mm. It would just be very small and quiet. Now it's getting bigger because there's a lot of people who have this humra and there's a bit of a, uh, you know, sort of the way that uh, I was once at a, I was once at a, I was once a mashkiach for the KVH at an event at Harvard Business, at Harvard Divinity School. And I'm and like, okay, so some caterer was there. I showed up, I made sure everything was fine. Um, there were no kosher eating Jews at the event, mm -hmm. but they said, mm -hmm. you know, we basically, we make every event kosher because we want everyone to be able to eat. So mm -hmm. now all the, uh, you know, all the caterers and the catering halls and the manufacturers are like, we, want, we don't want to lose a wedding because someone's Rebbe eats Chadash and isn't going to come. So there's a growing market for it. So it's going to have, I mean, it's happening naturally and it's happening fast because it's, it's a big community. But uh, you have to, uh, you can't rush into things necessarily. Got to have proper respect for how people uh, operate. Shkayach. Shkayach. All right, thanks for coming.